This evening we are back into Galatians chapter 5, so if you'd like to follow along in the, the reading of this text, I encourage you to, uh, to turn there. Galatians chapter 5, and I'd like to read for you verses 13 through 17, 13 through 17. And again, what we're wanting to see from this passage is what Paul tells us that we need to do to be able to overcome our flesh and to do what the Lord actually calls us to do, beginning in verse 13. Paul writes this, "'For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love.'" serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Again, may the Lord bless His Word to us this evening. May He use it to build us up. Now, this morning, I just want to remind you we saw something we're very much aware of from our own experience that we do have two sets of desires in our hearts. And when, when the Bible talks about our heart, it is referring to our soul, of course, not to the organ that is beating in our chest, but rather to our affections. Our affections are torn. They're going two different directions. One of our desires is toward the world, towards sin, and the other one is towards God. Now, towards sin because of Adam's sin, and towards God because of what Jesus Christ has done for us through His Holy Spirit. And because we have these two desires, we also have a struggle. We're struggling between our desire to do what's good and our desire to do what is bad. And Paul tells us in verse 17, the result is that we cannot do what it is we want to do. Now, he doesn't mean by this that we're paralyzed that we can't do anything good at all or do anything bad at all. We just can't do what it is that we would like to do in the way that we would like to do it, in the way that Jesus did it. If we're believers here this evening, we do have a desire in our hearts to be perfect, to do what Jesus would do in every circumstance. Paul is telling us that that's not going to be possible because of the sin in our hearts. But the question we want to ask this evening is this, is, is Paul basically telling us that's just the way it is and you need to live with it, that there's nothing that you can do about it? Has the Lord basically left us to dream about the good that we would like to do but left us powerless actually to do it? Well, no, because Paul tells us how we might actually make progress, how we might actually grow spiritually. He says in verse 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. By the way, notice that second part. If you walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desire of the flesh, which means you can resist it, you can thwart it, you can do what is right. There is a way actually to become stronger to gain more of that power that the Holy Spirit uh, wants to give us, to weaken the flesh and that evil desire and to become more like Jesus. It's summarized in, in this one sentence. We need to walk by the Spirit. So what I'd like us to do this evening is to look at two things. First of all, what that means. And then secondly, I want us to see some practical ways in which we can actually do this. So first of all, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Well, it means, first of all, we have been looking at over the past several Lord's Days, and maybe not specifically over the Lord's Days, but you'll hear me say 
a number of times that we need to be filled with the Spirit. Okay, it certainly means that, as we saw last week. You need to use the means of grace to gain more of the Spirit's influence. It doesn't just strike you automatically. God doesn't just fill you automatically from heaven. It would be nice if we had some kind of a you know, spiritual tube, as it were, or hose that was connected to us, and it didn't really matter what we do, that it was constantly flowing towards us. But that's not the way it works. There's something we have to do to receive it. We have to use these means. And, of course, we need to be careful not to lose what we gain by giving in to the flesh, by sinning, by compromising. But there is something else that we need to be aware of as well, something that is a part of this, something that we already know that could be summarized in basically the second part of what I brought under the first part, something we need to constantly be reminding ourselves of, and that is that when you use the means of grace and when you get this uh, this filling of the Spirit and you gain more of His influence, it does increase your desire, as it were. It pushes you towards the things of the Lord, and it does weaken the things of the Spirit, but that doesn't mean that that's all you need, that there's something more that needs to be done. It, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't mean that having, let's say, a, a stronger desire for the things of the Spirit that you're necessarily going to choose what the Spirit is leading you to choose over against what the flesh is actually influencing you to choose. There's something more you need to do, as I said. You have to commit yourself to do two things, to yield to the Spirit and at the same time to resist the flesh. Now, again, I believe this is included by what, what we were looking at before, but I don't know that we necessarily have focused on that aspect, so I do want to focus on it this evening because I do believe that uh, walking by the Spirit is more than just walking by the power of the Spirit. It's also walking by the, the leading of the Spirit. He is a teacher, uh, an anointing that has been given to us by God to teach us all things and to lead us into the truth. We have to follow Him as He seeks to lead us. Now, I wanted to look at a couple of practical illustrations of this because I think perhaps we can all relate to these. I mean, haven't you, haven't you yourself found yourselves often uh, when, you're, when you're faced, let's say, with a clear choice? You know what it is that God wants you to do. You even have the desire to do it because you have the Spirit of God in you moving you that direction. But as you know, there's also a part of you that, that doesn't want to do it, something that makes you want to do what's wrong. And yet having the desire to do what's right and maybe even having a stronger desire, though this may sound a little bit contradictory, you still end up choosing the wrong thing instead. Now, again, let me just give you an illustration, and again, I think this is one that perhaps you can all relate to. I, <laughs> certainly, I can. Maybe the Lord gives you the opportunity to bring the gospel to someone, you know, someone that you care about, a family member, a, a neighbor, somebody that you work with. Now, as Christians, we want to share the gospel with them because we know that it's the only way they're going to be saved. The only way they're going to escape what the Bible tells us is the consequences of our sin, which is hell. And now that you have that opportunity, as you've been basically praying that God would give it to you, now that you're faced with this opportunity, suddenly your flesh begins to fight against you, okay? Well, what does it do? First of all, it tells you, you don't really want to do this because if you do, they're going to ridicule you. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to think you're some kind of a fool. Or if you share this with your friends, maybe this person doesn't want to be your friend anymore. I mean, have you ever, have you ever actually shared the gospel with a friend and lost that friend? It, it happens, and your flesh can say, you really don't want to risk that friendship. So anyway, you, you feel these, these contrary desires, and you begin to argue with yourself. The flesh can even, you know, introduce ideas into your mind that 
you know, that may happen or may not happen. Maybe they won't believe you. Maybe they've already heard the gospel and you really don't need to make, you know, take this risk after all. Maybe they're already a believer, even though you know from the way they live that they're not. Or maybe they're not really in danger after all. Maybe the Bible really isn't true. Have you ever heard those things in your mind? Have you ever wrestled with yourself and, and experienced those things as you're, as you're getting ready, as you're, as you're seeking to bring the gospel to someone else? Well, sometimes, again, you know, you want to do, you want to share the gospel, you've prayed, here's the opportunity, and yet, as the flesh comes against you, you choose to remain quiet, even though you know God has given you the opportunity, even though you know God commands you to tell the gospel to them, to share it with them, you end up choosing not to. Does that sound at all familiar? Have you ever experienced that, that struggle? Or maybe there are other circumstances where you have a choice between something that is spiritually profitable and maybe your alternate choice isn't necessarily sinful but it's still one that your flesh prefers over what you might do that, that is actually spiritually good. Maybe you want to pray and read your Bible because you know if you do that, it's going to be spiritually profitable. It's going to help you grow. But suddenly you remember there's a program on TV that you really wanted to see or maybe a video game that you really wanted to play with a friend. Or maybe a friend calls you on the phone or texts you and you get involved in this conversation and you, you kind of want to do that. Your flesh, you know, wants to get you away from the, the spiritually profitable thing or maybe they want to get together with you and you choose to do that over what might be more, you know, again, beneficial. Or maybe suddenly you remember something that you needed to do that you forgot to do. Suddenly, you know, your mind, it pops up in your mind and... Uh, you leave what's more important aside to do something which is much less valuable, that's much less important. Basically, the Spirit is leading you to do one thing, but the flesh is drawing you to do something else. Well, again, that's the struggle that we have to face, isn't it? That's the two desires that are fighting against each other. But the point is, you have to make a choice between them. You have to choose either to yield to the Spirit of God or to yield to your flesh. Now, the Lord knows, of course, He knows you very well. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what's going on in your heart, which is why He commands you through the Apostle Paul to walk by the Spirit. Now, certainly, as we've seen, He means by this to be filled with the Spirit, to walk by His power, but He also means to yield to the Spirit as the Spirit seeks to lead you. You know, there's, there's, there's different phrases, uh, different ways that things can be said in the Greek that, that can actually have a variety of meanings. And sometimes I think the Lord wraps them all up in this kind of, in, in this one phrase. Walk by the Spirit. Well, what does that mean, walk by the Spirit? Because it's not specifying exactly what that means. Well, it certainly means to walk in the power of the Spirit, but it also means to walk by the leading of the Spirit, as I mentioned before. He is the anointing that teaches you all things. He is the one who is going to lead you into the truth. He's the one who's going to lead you to do the right thing. He's the one, as we read in, in Romans chapter 8, who actually fulfills the law of God in you by giving you a desire to do that. So He's drawing your heart out in that direction. He wants you to follow Him and not to yield to your flesh. Now, what this means is that your work isn't done once you've used the means of grace. The work is just beginning because you're, you're basically elevating the desire uh, of the Spirit at least, you know, you want to elevate it above the desire of the flesh, but you, you're, you're seeking to make it stronger. Sanctification, which is what we're talking about here, 
is a cooperative work. It's a work that the Spirit of God does in your heart, but it's also a work that you must do. Now, God gives you His Holy Spirit, giving you the power to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are saved by grace through faith alone. The, what we're talking about here is not how you save yourself. We're talking about the results of that salvation. But once the Lord saves you and gives you His Holy Spirit, He expects you to do your part. The Spirit is going to do His. You need to do yours. You need to gain His influence, His power, and you need to submit to Him. Okay, you need to obey Him. You need to follow Him. But now, how do you do this? You know, it's, I just gave you a couple of examples, you know, about what if we're faced with uh, sharing the gospel with someone or we're going to try to do something spiritually beneficial. But we need to understand that these choices that we have to make to yield to the spirit or to the flesh are not just, um, you know, centered or relegated on, on, you know, these things we think of as like major things or, you know, these larger, uh, larger issues, but rather it's every single decision that we are faced with at every moment in our life because the Spirit is going to be leading us one way and the flesh is going to be leading us the other. And with every single choice, we need to make the right choice to follow the Spirit of God. Now, how do you do that? Well, here's some practical ways or at least ways that you've got to do it. First of all, you have to want to do it. You know, I, I think that that's, that's fairly obvious. Now, when the Spirit of God takes up residence in your soul, He gives you the desire. He makes you want to do that. But as we've seen, the desire can be weak or the desire can be strong. And if you want to walk by the Spirit, you must have a strong desire. I think, again, tell me if it isn't true that it's never so strong that you can't give in to the flesh. I don't think it, perhaps at any moment in our lives, it, it gets to be that powerful, but that's what we need to be striving after. The strongest desire we possibly can have, because you know, again as well as I, that you're going to do what it is you want to do. That's the way it is. We always do what we want to do, and oddly enough, even when the desire of the Spirit may even be stronger in our hearts, we can still choose to do the other. So you need to strengthen that desire as strong as you can get it by using the means of grace and particularly praying and asking God specifically for His Holy Spirit. Jesus tells us on more than one occasion that if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? You just need to ask and keep on asking and keep on seeking that God would fill you to give you that strength of heart so that you will choose what the Spirit of God is presenting to you. And by the way, remember that the one you're asking loves you and He wants you to succeed. That's why He commands you to be filled with the Spirit. That's why He commands you to walk by the Spirit. He actually wants you to do this, so He's not going to withhold it from you. He's going to help you if that's what you really want. He is going to give you His Spirit. Now, secondly, this, this is, again, very important. You do need to train your mind to be able clearly to recognize the difference between the things of the Spirit of God and the things of the flesh to recognize them as soon as you're confronted with them. In other words, it's immediately apparent to you what is the right way and what is the wrong way. Now, how do you do that? How do you know the difference? Well, there's only one way, and it's not by just saying, well, seems to me, <laughs> you know, this is what I think is right. This is what I think is wrong. I, I mean, it's just obvious, isn't it? Well, no, it's not always altogether obvious unless you are saturated with the Word of God. You have to read it. You have to study it. You have to understand what it's saying. You have to agree with it that what it says is best so that when you are presented with the choice 
again, you immediately know this is what the Spirit of God wants me to do. This is what the flesh wants me to do. You have to be able to tell the difference. And then thirdly, when you are presented with these choices, and again, I mean, even as I'm speaking, you're presented with a choice either to accept what, what the Bible is saying or not to accept it. We have to yield to the Spirit, okay? When you're presented with a choice, you have to do, you know, not just be willing to do, but you must be committed to do what God says. You need to yield to the Spirit. You need to obey Him and to resist what your flesh is seeking to get you to do. Basically, you need to do what we're exhorted to do over and over in Scripture. As Paul tells us in Romans 13, 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for your flesh with regard to its lusts. In other words, you need to, when you're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not like, you know, uh, there's, there's something you physically put on, but you are putting on His character. You are seeking to think like He would think. You're seeking to desire what He would desire and to do what He would do and not do the opposite. Put on Jesus Christ, become like Him, and do not allow any room in your life to fulfill the desires of the flesh. You must be willing, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24, uh, in reference to the former manner of life, to lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted accord in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. You need to see yourself, as Paul says, that you should see yourself because if you're trusting Jesus Christ, this is actually true of you, that you need to see yourself as having died with Jesus Christ on the cross. Remember, He is our Vicar, and if you understand that properly, his atonement was vicarious, which means he takes our place on the cross. His life was vicarious. He lived in our place. His death was vicarious. He died for us. When he rose again, that was also vicarious, his ascent into heaven. All of these things he did for us, but if we're trusting Jesus Christ and by the Spirit have been put in Jesus Christ, we actually were with him. We died with him on the cross. We were buried with Him, and we have been raised again to life with Him, no longer to live according to the lusts of the flesh, but now to yield ourselves to the Lord as instruments of righteousness, which is what Paul says in Romans 6, 11 through 13. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, dead to the desires of the flesh, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts, and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. By the way, you need to remember that when you came to Jesus Christ, you took up His cross and you bound yourself to do exactly this. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus Christ. Die to yourself. As Paul says in Romans 8 verses 12 through 13, so then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, as we sang this morning and, and actually I think this afternoon as well, through Wesley's hymn, And Can It Be, when that light flashed in the dungeon as we were bound in chains. The Lord broke the chains off of us. We are no longer bound. We are no longer obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Paul says, for if you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So we are bound now by our commitment to the Lord, we are bound by the, the Spirit's work in our hearts and by what Jesus Christ has done for us to yield to the Spirit and to deny our flesh, to seek to put the desires of the flesh to death. And by the way, the more you um, use the means of grace to gain the Spirit of God, the more you yield to the Spirit 
the weaker your flesh will become, the more it will be mortified, put to death. Now, we do have to remember, too, that when we give in to the flesh, there are certain things that happen, and I think we should um, use those as motivations to resist the flesh and to yield to the Spirit. Uh, when you yield to the flesh, it, it does offend God, doesn't it? Because you're doing something He hates. He hates the flesh. He hates the garment spotted by the flesh, as it were. He hates sin, and He won't have sin in His presence. That's why He sent His Son into the world to destroy sin. When you yield to the flesh, you also strengthen its influence in your life, and you weaken the Spirit's influence. When you yield to the flesh, you're basically committing sin, and remember, it was your sin that nailed Christ to the cross. He went to the cross to discharge, to pay for your sins. When you yield to the flesh, you basically allow it to rob you of the blessings that God has for you, kind of like little faith, remember? How the three, uh, those three brothers came and took away his, his money. There were certain things that it couldn't take away from him because he really belonged to the Lord, but it certainly made his life more difficult. The flesh will rob you of those things, those blessings that are yours here that God intends for you to have, and it will rob you of your reward in heaven. It's a thief that wants to take away from you everything that God has for you. And don't forget what Paul says in Romans 8, 13, that if you do not put the death, the deeds of the body, if you do not kill that flesh, you will die. But on the other hand, when you yield to the Spirit, you do please God. When you yield to the Spirit, His influence in you is strengthened. When you yield to the Spirit, you not only experience more blessings in this world, but you also store up more treasures in heaven. So basically the point is this that life is a series of choices. I mean, that's, that's what it is. Every single moment you're having to make a choice. You have to choose. We can really divide everything into two groups. You have to choose between what the Spirit of God wants you to do and you have to choose between that and what the flesh is tempting you to do. Every moment you're making choices that are either going to strengthen you spiritually or are going to weaken you spiritually. And when you add all these choices up and the choices you make, they're going to have a profound impact on your life. So what should you do? Make sure that you strongly desire to do what the Lord wants you to do. Use the means of grace to gain more of the Spirit's influence. Make sure you're trusting Jesus Christ and you're filled with His Holy Spirit. Make sure you know the difference between what the Spirit wants you to do and what the flesh wants you to do by reading and studying God's Word. By the way, this is a great argument to participate in the Reading the Bible Together program because that is the reason why we're reading it, is because we want to know these things. If you do this, it's going to help you a lot. And then each time you're faced with a choice, and again, you're faced with choices moment by moment. Make sure you yield to the Spirit. Make sure that you choose what it is that's pleasing to God, what it is that the Spirit of God is, is wanting you to do, and make sure you're resisting the flesh. Paul says, if you will do this, you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Are you wondering why you so often choose to do things that are wrong? It's because of those, perhaps those smaller choices you're making, those little compromises along the way that weaken you spiritually. Sometimes we think of these choices only in the big things, but these are choices that we have to make moment by moment in absolutely everything. So yield to the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. If you yield to the Spirit, you will have more power you will have much more power, the power that Jesus Christ actually came into this world to give you so that you could do His will.
And if you do this, you will stand out as God looks for someone throughout, again, as He looks throughout the earth for that one whose heart is completely His, you will stand out because your heart will be His. So may the Lord grant to each of us the grace to yield to the Spirit. You know, this I think is perhaps one of the most important things that, that the Bible has to say as far as our own personal sanctification. Be filled with the Spirit and then yield to the Spirit and resist the flesh. Moment by moment, choice by choice, the more you choose what is right, the stronger you're going to be. So again, may God give us all the grace to choose what is right. Let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we, and ask that the Lord would help us to do that.